Um, so I'm Michael Barber. I'm at Tor University of California, where I'm an associate professor of instructional technology or instructional design, sorry. And um, this is the State of the Nation K-12 e-learning in Canada presentation. I'll let Randy introduce himself. Yeah, Randy Labonte with the Canadian e-learning network, which is a consortium of some of the larger programs and individuals that uh, we used to meet at, at uh, in the U.S. at something called INACL, which is DLAC, uh, and we decided to start to formalize it in Canada. So we support research, much like uh, Michael's work here with the uh, State of the Nation, which has been gone, going for a number of years, uh, as well as uh, professional learning, as well as PD opportunities. So partner with DLAC, with John Watson, and uh, also uh, looking forward to the close in the, the, this particular session because we may be doing hybrid again <laughs> as well for ourselves next year. Uh, so seeing how this all goes. So, And if you want to do any introductions, tell us a little bit about yourself. Just use one of the two text chats, whether it be Zoom or in Pathable. All right. So as Randy mentioned, we've been doing this study now for quite a while. Um, the report that is currently up online, the one that reports on the 2019-2020 school year, is actually the 13th one that we've been uh, that we've done in the past. As you can see uh, from the variety of covers on the screen, uh, we started off uh, partnering with INACO, and actually, I have John to sort of thank for conceiving of the project because two years before I started working through these uh, studies. Uh, John had started doing the Keeping Pace reports, uh, Keeping Pace with at the time it was K-12 online learning. And being a Canadian, even though I was working in the U.S. at the time, um, I just didn't think that was fair that they had one in the U.S. and we didn't have one in Canada. So I managed to talk to the good folks at INACL. Actually, as you can see, it was still NACL at the time, the North American Council for Online Learning, into partnering with me and sponsoring that very first report. And for the next five years, they would be the primary publisher of the report. Um, then, since then, Open School BC and or the Manitoba First Nations Educational Resource Center uh, have been the main publishers. And in recent years, so for the last three, it's been um, the Open School BC crowd. And as you can see, Candy Learn has been a partner with us for, I guess it's been the last, I think, set, six reports now, maybe. Um, are we that old yet, Randy? Six years that Kenny Learn's been around? Oh, at least that was 2014. Yeah, so it would be the last six reports thing because this yeah. was the 2020 report. Um, so I'd be remiss if I didn't mention some of our sponsors just because um, without them, the report wouldn't exist. So as I mentioned, Open School BC has been our publisher for most of the past decade. Um, and for the last six years, Kenny Learn has been a project partner. And then uh, Learn, which is a blended and online program in Quebec. Um, the Virtual High School, which uh, was one of the original virtual high schools um, in Canada and is based in Ontario. And then the Ontario Virtual School uh, were all sponsors of this year's report. So uh, I dropped the link in the chat in Pathable, but the project website is available at uh, K12 SOTN or State of the Nation. Uh, .ca. And that's really what we've primarily used to keep the reports going in recent years. So um, I guess it was about three or four years ago, actually, it might be five or six now, because they all sort of run together. After a while, uh, we stopped producing a um, province by province, territory by territory detailed report and continued to put the detailed information here under this data and information area. Um, and the actual PDFs of the report sort of just briefly summarize that in theory, focusing specifically upon any changes that had happened. So if there weren't many changes, um, then the profile for that particular jurisdiction uh, was rather short. And as uh, the, the website notes, the goals of this study were really twofold. You know, how are K-12 online and blended learning or distance online and blended learning regulated in each of the individual jurisdictions? And then what's kind of happening in terms of the level of activity in each of those jurisdictions? Um, so based upon that, uh, we've had sort of really five tools that we've had in our toolkit to uh, look at 
uh, what, uh, you know, what's going on across the com- country. Uh, we send a survey to each of the ministries and departments of education. Uh, we often follow up with uh, either in, well, I wouldn't say in person, but usually it used to be telephone. These days it's all Zoom because uh, even though a question that could be answered in five minutes on the telephone seems to end up with a half hour Zoom meeting these days. Um, we used to do a document analysis of things that were available. And most Canadian ministries have been really good at putting some information available on the web, um, even prior to the, the, the pandemic. Um, and then because it took a while for many of the ministries to start to make this a regular part of their function in terms of providing us with information, uh, we developed a pretty good network across the country of key stakeholders, many of which were some of the founding uh, members of, of Can eLearn. Um, and so we still continue to, to use them as a source of data for the project because there's a lot of times where what is the regulation on paper doesn't necessarily look exactly like the regulation in action. And oftentimes it's those key stakeholders that help us with that. The last component we have is actually an individual program survey where we've attempted to identify every single uh, online distance and blended program across the country and sending surveys out to them every year so that they can update their data. Um, that tends to get a, a variable response. So, uh, for example, looking at the 2019-2020 school year, uh, we were able to identify 245 distinct programs. About 20% of them overall were uh, responded. As you can see, some provinces much better than others. Um, while I don't have a slide for it uh, in the in the past, I've often had a second slide for this that looks at all of the individual responses we've received since we started doing it. Um, I can tell you that we've heard from about 55% of the K-12 distance online and blended programs in the country at least once. Um, Now, some of them, we haven't heard from them in five and six years, uh, but we've gotten responses from all of them, or about 60% of them at least once. Some provinces more so than others. So one I will point out there, that's a bit of a black hole for us. You can see Manitoba only had one of the 38 this year. And I think we actually only have five or six from Manitoba that have ever responded. Uh, So the proportion that we have from that province tends to be quite small. Um, Similarly with Ontario, I think we're looking at about 30 to 35 percent of the programs in Ontario that have responded to us at least once. Oops, sorry, my finger hit that a little bit. Um, So there are a couple of areas where I think we could probably find a lot more information. Now, one of the things we're a little bit lucky with is that at least in the case of Manitoba, their ministry is quite good about the nature of data that they collect. Um, So while it would be nice to be able to get some of the program by program data, um, we're not losing anything from a provincial perspective, whereas in Ontario, we are for a variety of reasons. So if you look at the country as a whole um, right now, this is sort of what we're, we're looking at. Uh, we have a variety of either jurisdictions that rely solely upon provincial programs, uh, primarily upon district or school board based programs, and then a few provinces that are using a combination of both. And this has remained fairly consistent over the years. There have been a few uh, changes throughout. Um, and um, even when you look at sort of how this is a, I guess, a sort of a simplistic overview of it, uh, I'll use Ontario as an example. Um, while Ontario relies primarily upon programs that are run at the school board level, a lot of the services that they get are centralized through the Ministry of Education right now, specifically the uh, the technology enabled learning organization or Learning Ontario or Learning Unit. Um, TILO in in the province. So they provide uh, content, they provide learning management system, student information system, uh, they provide personnel that they actually put in each of the um, in each of the school boards across the province. Uh, I think the current name is TELC, Technology Enabled Learning Coordinator, Uh, but over the years they've been DELCs and ELCs and a variety of other things 
um, depending upon sort of when you looked at it. Uh, so while it's in the blue, it really, you know, that blue is very different, say, than the blue that you get in British Columbia, uh, where the ministry, at least in recent years, um, I guess for the last 15 years or 16 years, hasn't had much of a provincial presence or centralized role, although that may be changing in the next couple of years. Uh, there's been talk and and consultations around that for quite some time now. And again, this is also a snapshot in time. Uh, so when you look at Alberta as an example, for those of you, and I know we've got at least one person in the audience uh, from uh, Calgary, was it Randy? No. <laughs> oh. Some, the, 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 uh, she's not actually in the audience. Oh, so. okay. But All right. I would understand it because she's at the University of Calgary in Alberta. But yeah. So Alberta is an example. While it's accurate for the 2019 2020 school year, um, as of the end of that school year, the Alberta Distance Learning Center, which was the provincial, uh, the province wide uh, program that existed, uh, no longer exists. So next year, um, Alberta will be going from that purplish color to a blue color. Um, yeah, and generally, arguably British Columbia may be going to a mixed color. <laughs> yes, yes, and and so you know this is 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 good for a point in time, but um, it, it's it's uh, changes some variability from school year to school year. Uh, I will note that you'll see the territories up top um, are sort of a funny looking red, and that's because they've been piloting a provincial or in their case a territorial wide program. Um, but they still rely upon programs from the southern provinces. Um, in the case of Nunavut, which is the one to the far right, uh, they rely solely upon programs from the southern provinces, as does Prince Edward Island, which is that one island over there in Atlantic Canada that's kind of surrounded by most of the red ones, although that will also be changing next year as well. Um, so that'll give you some sense as to sort of the types of programs that are around. In terms of how they're regulated, uh, one of the interesting things is that while most provinces have some comment about distance learning in provincial legislation, in most cases, it's just a reference in the Education Act or the Schools Act that says that the minister or the department shall have the authority to regulate distance education. And that's the only legislative regulation around um, distance learning. Uh, the two exceptions are Nova Scotia and um, British Columbia. Uh, British Columbia has a uh, one section in the Schools Act and one section in the Independent Schools Act uh, that have uh, actually a significant number of clauses that are a little bit lengthy that go through and describe a, a regulatory regime. In the case of Nova Scotia, it's actually the collective agreement that the government has uh, with the Nova Scotia Teachers Union, which is passed as an act of the government, um, that there is a clause in that particular uh, collective agreement that focuses specifically upon distance education. So if you exclude all of those provinces where it's just referenced in a single sentence, really it's policy handbooks that tend to be the main driver of regulatory activity in Canada. Uh, so what you find is that you have the Ministry of Education will either put forth the manual or oftentimes have some kind of agreement or a combination of the two that school districts have to agree to uphold in order to run or participate in a distance program. Um, for the most part, these tend to be fairly benign um, in those jurisdictions that do have them. And they really just provide sort of a framework for them, um, not like you see in the U.S. with a lot of the legislative uh, requirements that you would find, particularly around full-time online learning in the U.S. In terms of the, sorry, go ahead, Randy. Five minutes. Oh, um, in terms of the uh, the level of activity, as you can see, overall, we've got about 6% of the problem or the country that's doing this kind of stuff. Um, and you can see between the, there's a lot that are a lot lower than that. There's a couple that are a lot above that. And really it's only Manitoba and Ontario that are near the average. So we've got a lot of people that are doing a little bit, a couple of people that are doing a lot. And because of that, the national percentage or national average kind of falls in the middle. 
Um, typically speaking, Alberta and B British Columbia are always near the top here. Um, Saskatchewan and Manitoba are the two that have actually been growing significantly. If you were to look at this a couple of years ago, that number would have been down in the two and three percentage points. To give you a sense of the growth over time since we've started looking at it, um, so 20 years ago, just over 20 years ago, uh, the Canadian Teachers Federation estimated there are about 25,000. And then the rest of these are the numbers we've come up with since we've started looking at these. And you can see since really most of the last decade, we've been in that five or 6% range as we've been looking at it. So it's been fairly consistent. Um, if you look at the level of blended activity that we've got across the country, uh, we've stopped actually giving direct figures for it. Uh, we stopped as of two reports ago, uh, but up until that point, you can see sort of the numbers we were estimating. And the difficulty is, and you can see all the asterisks on the, uh, on the, uh, the, the chart here and, and what they all mean, but essentially in some cases it was just programs that were being extrapolated from what was in the learning management data that was in the provincial learning management system. In some cases, the ministry would provide us with a figure, but that was just with a figure based upon what they knew. Um, you know, if you had a teacher or a school that were doing blended things, those types of things would never be um, never be known about. And even stuff we were able to extract from the individual program survey. We were asking online and distance programs. You know, so again, that average school that might be doing blended learning, we had no idea that that's what they were up to and, and never bothered to ask and wouldn't know to ask and they wouldn't know to complete our survey. Um, so seeing that we are um, at 10 after and I think we officially finish at 15 after so it gives us a couple of minutes for questions. Um, I don't know if any have been coming in in the chat and pathable I haven't seen no, anything come I through. I haven't seen anything come So we've got basically, well, I guess now officially four minutes uh, left for questions. Um, yeah, and I think one, one of the things that might be helpful, particularly Jason, I'm not sure where Jason's from, but um, the, the difference between uh, federal oversight in Canada versus in the US uh, and why there's variation uh, across uh, Canada is uh, there isn't national standards, uh, there isn't um, a federal uh, in, you know, funding or incentive that rolls back into the schools. There are no grants that come necessarily federally. Uh, there may be some research pieces. There is a grant that uh, establishes Canada as a bilingual nation. So for minority language in a Francophone province, there's some funding that is rolled there for English, Anglophone um, systems as well. And the only other piece that the feds step into is in First Nations which now they've been devolving a lot of the education directly to the bands and the nations themselves so that they're responsible, but still have some policy oversight funding uh, within that structure. And so Mary Gona has joined us as well. She's the candidate, uh, doctoral candidate at University of Calgary as well. So uh, welcome, glad you could make it. There's uh, in the files, Mary Gona is a, a document PDF you can download. Uh, with some links and some follow-ups. So essentially, yeah, there's it's a little different in terms of the landscape here, which also makes it a little bit more problematic. And of course, uh, population is that much less. So we do have a long history of working in distance education at the start and now with online. However, uh, we don't quite have the same mass of population which we're working from. But, the, but Ontario, I don't know whether Ontario is worth chatting a little bit about as well, uh, or whether there's other questions. I haven't seen any questions pop up, so I was just going to fill in, in my ideas and impressions. Yeah, I mean, same as if, if, you know, in the absence of questions, and I don't know if anyone wrote in the poll, Randy, about uh, what nope. they were. I didn't see anything go in there either. Okay. Um, but uh, I have moved to, you know, if something does come to you like an hour from now or tonight or tomorrow or next week or next month, uh, you see our contact information there on the, the screen. And uh, other than that, I mean, uh, I can tell you that the, the reports, at least the last, I think, three of them uh, have been published in both English and French. Um, or last four, I guess now, if you count the current one, uh, the French version of the current one won't be available until um, probably I'm going to guess sometime next week. 
I just saw the last draft with some comments <clears throat> in it today. Certainly by July. Yes, yes, certainly by July. So we're only a school year behind at this point. Um, the <laughs> other thing I should mention is when you look at this year's report, um, because it's reporting on the 2019-2020 school year, it doesn't include a lot of the remote learning that happened because, um, well, A, because it's remote learning, not uh, online learning. And since we've got about a minute left, that's probably a good time to I don't know if you've got a link for tomorrow's session there, Randy, or not. No, I, I don't, but it's at, uh, it's at uh, 11, 30, 10.30. Yes, yeah, so we've got a session tomorrow with one of our colleagues um, that is looking at um, pandemic studies that we've done over the past year about remote learning and how that has ended up becoming operationalized across Canada, um, both during the um, initial stages when we were sort of all scrambling at the end of the last school year, but also as the um, also as the school year has um, there, I just got it in the thing there. Okay. Um, also, as the school year has uh, progressed this particular year, uh, so we've done a series of. Uh, four reports, if you count the one that we intended to do first, but ended up doing last. Um, and then there's a fifth one that's currently being worked on um, that we'll be able to talk a little bit about tomorrow. And we're at quarter after, which I think is. Yeah. Our, Give uh, us some feedback from the polls as well. And don't forget, there's a file there for you to download with all the links and contact information. 